Good morning. Welcome to SUNUP. I'm Austin Moore. Today we're coming to you from the southeast corner of the state where trees, not grains, are the major crop. Forests cover only 17% of Oklahoma's land, yet they provide the third largest agricultural crop. And when you look at value added dollars, the numbers go through the roof. Forestry is a, a huge industry in Oklahoma. You really don't realize it unless you travel to southeast Oklahoma. Uh, but it's uh, you know, over a billion dollar per year industry. Roughly about 1.5 million acres is pine plantation. And there's a lot of additional forestry that's going on in, in uh, less intensively managed areas. Warehouser is a major player in this industry, managing more than 500,000 acres in Oklahoma. They gave our Dave Deacon a hard hat and a tour of a logging site. These machines are amazing. With something that looks more like a molar tooth than any saw blade, this feller buncher cuts through the trees like blades of grass and then, then just lays them down. But that's just the start. Skitters, you can see over there, they come in. They drag it from where, from the stump to the delimmer. Uh, the delimmer, he processes the wood out, lays it out, the loader sets it out out of his way, okay. and he's the one that puts it on the trucks and they take it to the mill. The tracks average about 120 acres in size, with 500 to 700 trees per acre, and all of that will be harvested in about two weeks' time. That keeps these trucks on the road pretty steadily. Good average would be 30, 35 logs to, to a load. We're trying to get at least 15 a day. We're averaging 16 right now. I asked Warehouser Harvest Manager and Oklahoma State graduate, Corey Baufler, to show me around a harvest site. Uh, what we're, we're loading here is uh, what we call topwood fiber. It's going to be going to the uh, paper mill in Valiant, Oklahoma to be processed and uh, you know be shipped all over the world. But this is kind of the tops of the trees. Right. Uh, it's got too many limbs, and it doesn't meet what we, our grade specification to be turned into lumber at the Idaville facility. So what happens after this? After this, uh, we have a uh, early rotation department that will come in here and make a, uh, a prescription. Uh, it could be, you know, they may want to treat some of the hardwood brush. Uh, they may want to uh, burn some of these piles, and we don't do any broadcast burning. We do remove some of the piles so we can get those uh, dozers through to rip and uh, get our tree, a good rip for our tree to grow in. But basically it'll go to our early rotation department and they'll make some sort of prescription, uh, you know, how to get the best survival and, and uh, growth out of our, our seedlings that we're gonna plant this winter. Okay, just for clarification, ripping means they come in and they pull up the root balls and do all that? Well, it's, 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 a, it's usually a D8 okay. dozer. It's got a, 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 just a big shank that we call a ripping shank. Right. And it makes kind of like a furrow, fractures the soil, uh -huh. and makes a furrow. And uh, you know, that does several different things. It, it, it breaks the soil, does a little bit of tillage, right. and uh, uh, kind of a little micro site for that tree to grow in. So it's, a, it's, a, it's just basically to help your tree get a good head start. You see, the clear cut is really just the start of the next cycle. Just like with wheat or soybeans or any other crop, you have to harvest, then you replant. Only here, the timing is a little different. Warehouser Harvest Manager Ron Doremus explains. This is about a four, four to five year old plantation, mm -hmm. and it was put on about a 700 trees per acre. It will sit here for 10 to 15 years, and we'll come back and do our first year uh, rotation, which will be a first thin. Mm -hmm. uh, and then from there, it will be pruned, and then it will sit here for another a uh, few years and we try to come back in about 28 to 30 years and do the final harvest again. What's, what's the target height and, and uh, width of, of the tree? Ideally, we want something 14 to 16 in inches in, in diameter and, and height is uh, 40 to 60. Okay, and then the trees are taken from here, where do they go? The trees are taken from the logging site over to the, the lumber mills. Mm -hmm. and, and from there, then, then they're made into ever what is ordered from mm -hmm. two by fours to two by twelves. Does it stay here in Oklahoma or is this service? It does, it, uh, lots of it stays in Oklahoma. It's, uh, it's the trees grow in Oklahoma and it's processed in Oklahoma. 
and lots of the lumber stays in Oklahoma, but we also take some to Ar Arkansas, mm -hmm. uh, surrounding states, Mississippi, uh, could go plumb to New York. With 30 years between harvests, foresters have to keep a long view of their operation. Uh, the way we look at our environmental part is uh, trees today is trees for tomorrow. Whatever we got to do, yeah, it's water quality, uh, soil, you know, whatever we got to do for future generations to keep it to where the, my kids can come in and log it, you know, or whatever they decide to do. One way they address those concerns is with stream management zones, or SMZs. Those are 50-foot buffers surrounding waterways that go largely untouched, as you can see on this map. We have a uh, contractor paint the blue line right. so these operators know where the SMZ is, there's right. not any question, and he'll cut to that blue line and that's going to be what we what we call an SMZ to help protect, you know, water quality. Right. So, and it also is a good wildlife corridor, travel corridor for wildlife too. So it's got dual function. And that eye on the long term is comforting with this industry contributing such a healthy amount to the state economy. Of course, it's easy to see the revenue streams that the timber industry brings to this area, but the trees provide in more ways than one. Tourism is also a driving factor. We're bringing those Texans money over here and we like that. We like that very much. Chandra Rickey and Michelle Finch are entrepreneurs and tourism advocates. We've got what, second, third largest paper mill in the world, not too far, 30 minutes from where we're sitting. Um, the largest oriented strand board plant just on the edge of Broken Bow. Um, major timber industry that's harvesting this, this resource. Um, yet, we have this thriving tourism industry sitting right in the middle of it. And i got to be honest, in the probably 70s, 80s, I mean, for years, those of us who grew up here have said, they're going to cut it all and leave. That's been being said for 70, 80 years. And here we are with the sustainable timber industry, tourism industry. Warehouser did it right. It's, it's an amazing uh, success story of how you, you kind of can't have it all. Yes, they are. Together with Rhonda Reed, the ladies started Girls Gone Wine a booming success story, and Oklahoma winery in Hochitown. This business and so many others have benefited from the area's main tourist attraction, Beaver's Bend National Park. Beaver's Bend State Park was established way back in, in, in the early 1900s, but in the 1970s they created Broken Bow Lake. It was uh, one of those core of engineer projects to control flooding and generate some electricity and some other things, so they dammed up the uh, Mountain Fork River and created Broken Bow Lake. Well, of course, it's now 99% recreational. We met with Museum of the Red River director Henry Moy for some historical perspective on the area. Moy explained that part of the draw for tourists is what the area doesn't have. There's been a major uh, effort in this county to be sure that we maintain the naturalness as, as, as unique, as the unique aspect of our, of our tourism. Um, we have not allowed big water parks to come in. We have not allowed large shopping centers to come in. Um, and I think we're going to probably stick to that as much as we can. That natural environment has an incredible value, as extension economist Dave Scheidler tells us. Oklahoma Department of Wildlife and Fisheries uh, runs a trout fishery um, at the, the dam on the lower Mountain Fork River down in McCurtain County. Uh, and then they've done improvements to the uh, downstream portions uh, to actually support trout habitat. And so this has become a really hot um, and accessible uh, trout fishing area for particularly out-of-state anglers. What we found is it generates about $25 million worth of economic activity just in McCurtain County. And that's just out-of-state dollars. The park here has a, a huge tourism economic impact on the area. The museum here, we get about 1.2 million people that come into this area that visit the park each year. Doug Zook is program director for Oklahoma's Forest Heritage Center, located in Beaver's Bend. And these are all beaver sticks from the dam. It's always a huge surprise when people get here. And it's easy once you get a new visitor into the center and you tell them about the folk festival or wood turning competition or one of these things that we do, they'll come back, they'll, they'll book cabins. And those cabins are one of the unique aspects of this story. 
Well, the cabin industry um, has really taken off in the last five years. Before that, there were a few small cabins in the area and a few privately owned cabins. But in the last five years, we've um, grown to about five or 600. And when we say cabin, like this, this thing we're sitting in front of, you know, folks are coming here from Dallas, from Oklahoma City, from all over, and they're investing private dollars to build these cabins now for vacation homes. But what's really cool is they're putting them on the rental market and it pretty much almost pays for itself. And that employs housekeeping, that employs um, restaurants being built, uh, Girls Gone Line being built. I mean, the a builders, lot of the, the lumber the yards, lum yes, I mean, the whole area just, it's a great trickle down effect. The U.S. Travel Association estimates that travel generally uh, to the state of Oklahoma by both business and uh, leisure travelers was about $6.2 billion worth of direct spending by those, those travelers. They went on to estimate that that created about uh, $1.8 billion worth of payroll and supported about 75,000 jobs directly related to travelers and expenditures of those travelers. And that impact is something Southeast Oklahoma can toast. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. What a blessing for folks south of Interstate 40 and the Panhandle to finish September with multiple days of gentle rain. On a 10-day rainfall map from September 22nd to October 3rd, higher rainfall amounts were in the reddish-purple areas in Okfuskey, Hughes, and Garvin counties, with buyers recording just over six inches. Locations in the brown colored areas range from two and a half to four inches. Green colored areas receive between three quarters and two inches of rain. The blue areas typically had less than a half inch and poor Fairview recorded only seven hundredths over the 10 days. A plan available water map from the surface down to 16 inches shows how the rain impacted soil moisture. The brown areas typically have less than an inch of water available to plants. In contrast, most locations in green colored areas have more than three inches of available water in the top 16 inches of soil. Turning to the Keech Byram Drought Index, where the maximum dryness is 800, two locations are wet enough to be below 100, Byers and Okima. Two locations are still super dry, over 700, Red Rock and Winona, and too many locations are still over 500. Those areas with higher numbers on the Keech Byram Drought Index are those areas still under the governor's burn ban as of October 3rd. Such a patchwork pattern means you need to stay on top of what is in effect for your county. A web search for Oklahoma burn ban will get you to the current Oklahoma Forestry Department burn ban map. September 30th ended the latest water year. It started October 1st, 2011. A percent of normal rainfall for this last water year shows that most of the state came in between 80 and 100 percent of normal rainfall, the olive green colored areas. The light green dots were the few locations receiving between 100 and 120 percent of normal rainfall. The yellowish areas dropped down to between 60 and 80 percent of normal. As we know, rain timing has a huge impact, so annual numbers are not the whole story. October brings us closer to that first freeze. An earliest freeze map shows the panhandle has experienced those in the latter part of September, and that didn't happen this year. The green areas have experienced freezes as early as October 2nd. The red areas have seen early freezes in mid-October. A map of average freeze dates shows how these compare to earliest freeze dates. Average first freeze dates in the panhandle are in mid-October. Green areas fall closer to October 27th and yellow areas around November 1st. For red areas, the average first freeze is closer to November 8th. That's it for this time. 
We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Kim Anderson, our grain marketing specialist, joins us now. And Kim, everywhere we go, producers talking about the expiration of the Farm Bill and want to know how it's going to impact them. Well, I don't think it's going to have much impact. You know, 80% of the Farm Bill is a nutrition program, and it's, it's got funding irrespective of what happens. Our crop insurance programs, uh, they're also funded, and their funding is not impacted by that. The uh, impact will be on the uh, foreign market development program, that's our export uh, enhancement programs. Uh, that funding may stop, but with our tight stocks and wheat, corn, beans, and major commodities, I don't think that's going to have much impact. Uh, there, there will be 6.5 million acres of, uh, of cropland or land coming out of the Conservation Reserve this next year. Uh, there's no funding to put that back in, so that could have minor impact. And I don't know the impact on the direct payments or the shear payments or the acre payments. There could be some impact there. But again, we're talking out a couple, uh, uh, at least a year before we can see any impact on that. And we'll have the, the next program by that. And one last statement, not having a program is not anything new on the 96 Farm Bill and on the 2007 Farm Bills. We didn't have one at this time when they went on fall break. So, what, you know, it's Washington. Yeah, it is. So we just have to be prepared for that. Uh, looking ahead at next week, you are anticipating the new supply and demand uh, report being released. What are some of the, the early numbers that you're keeping an eye on? Well, I don't think there's going to be any impact on wheat or any changes on wheat. Uh, maybe slightly in Argentina or Australia and in the southern hemisphere. Uh, if you look at corn and soybeans, uh, most analysts I've been reading expect uh, the production for both of those commodities to go up and maybe put a little pressure on prices. Okay. You're also talking with producers uh, about prices and, and the question that's coming to you, will we see $9 wheat again? I, and I started at 25% this last week. I got down to a 20%, about a one out of five chance. So I think the market's going to just wallow around in this uh, $8.69 to $9.57 range. You know, we got a, a big move the other day from 872 to 927. Uh, we're going to continue to see this sideways, sideways pattern. Okay, we'll see you next week and look forward to that report. Thanks a lot, Kim Anderson. Many Oklahoma cow-calf producers again this winter will be using wheat pasture as a major part of their supplement program for the beef cows for certainly the purpose of getting adequate protein to those cows this winter. Getting the most and the best efficient utilization of that wheat pasture is very, very important. And some ways that we can increase the efficiency is by limit grazing that wheat pasture. And what I mean by that is that in the case of spring calving cows, those that through the course of, of most of the winter will be non-lactating but pregnant cows, we can put them on wheat pasture for one day and then off onto a dry pasture, say a native pasture or Bermuda grass for the other two to three days. And that'll allow them still to get enough protein. We have to make sure that if we do it that way, that there is enough forage in the other pasture or we have adequate amount of hay in order to meet the energy needs of those cows. For the fall calving cow or those spring calvers after they do calve in say February and March, then of course we need to spend more time on the wheat and in most cases they need to be on the wheat at least every other day in order to get enough protein to meet their needs. Now I think it's important that we understand that being out on the wheat for a day doesn't mean 24 hours. Usually the cattle will get enough of what they will need and actually begin to lay down and perhaps trample some of the wheat after three to five hours of grazing. And so this is a, a pretty good rule of thumb that if you're going to limit graze, move these cows on and off the wheat pasture, if they're out there three, four, five hours, that's usually long enough that then we can bring them back off and put them on the other pasture. You may want to have some basic idea of the uh, stocking rate that might best fit uh, wheat pasture, and it's so dependent upon the rain, how much rain we get and how much wheat pasture we can grow. A rule of thumb for those that are going to calve in the spring, 
generally a neighborhood of a cow per acre uh, in a good normal growing year would fit the bill. But let's remember, if we don't get as much rain, we'll have to stretch that out a little further. For those fall calving cows that are going to be grazing more often, then we probably better double that acreage for our expectation of how much wheat we need. And we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow-Calf Corner. Earlier in the show, you've seen a lot of timber and a lot of trees, but McCurtain County in southeast Oklahoma also has flatlands and crops. And we have Brad here to tell us about some of the uh, crops that are grown here in McCurtain County. What, what, what are we standing in here? Um, well, right now we're standing in a field of corn stubble, and then we're um, right next to us is a field of soybeans. This, um, this particular field, I believe, was harvested um, about three weeks ago, and then they've already been through and, and plowed the stubble one time. And this field of beans will be harvested in the, just the next couple of weeks. Okay, this this last year we've we've heard of more of an importance on corn. Mm -hmm. How's what, what what was the corn crop like here in McCurtain County? Well, surprisingly, um, pretty good. Uh -huh. um, this particular area of McCurtain County seemed um, to fare better than other parts. Um, seemed like you could drive to one field at the west side of the, of the county, and it'd be kind of poor. But as we got closer to the city of here in the central part of the county. Um, if the, anyone got a rain, they did. And um, from what I've been hearing, typical 110, 120 bushels per wow. acre. Wow. Um, up to near 140, 150 in some places. So it's been a, a really good year with the prices this year for our corn growers and should be looking pretty good for our soybeans as well. Well, definitely. I mean, this, let, let's talk about the geography here. I mean, this, you, you, you have the roll of the hill over there and then it rolls down into the, the, the flatland here that goes into the uh, Red River. Correct. Okay, so it, it's, it's prime for, for growing size. Yes, yeah, the river bottom, um, it ranges from, oh, usually about three or four miles on the north side of the river and then they'll also farm on the Texas side as well. Um, we have about 20,000 acres in cultivation here and usually corn is our um, crop of choice. If it's too wet or, um, or delayed planting, then we'll, soybeans will be a second, second choice. Not a lot of wheat. Mm -hmm. um, most of that will just be strictly for um, winter grazing for cattle mm -hmm. supplementation, but not a lot of stalker operators here. Now, now let, let's talk about some of the agriculture here. I mean, there's, there's uh, hogs and there's, and there's chickens. Well, it, yes, in the past we had hogs. Most of those have been um, closed down right. in recent years. Um, but one of the reasons um, the corn is a priority crop is because with um, the contract poultry production, um, I would guess 65 to 75 percent of the corn produced here in the county um, goes directly to the um, um, integrator's feed mill over at Broken Bow. So um, the corn's grown here, processed here, goes into chicken feed, and it'll leave here as a in a package of chicken for your family. So, which is perfect because it's all right here in McCurtain right. County. Correct, and it's you know it saves the integrator a lot of money from ship and feed um, mm -hmm. from Corn Belt states, and it's also good for our producers um, that they have a local market um, that that wants their corn and, and gives them a, a good price for it. Perfect. Okay. Well, Brad, thank you so much for joining us. And for more information about McCurtain County and some of the agriculture down here, check out our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Hi, welcome to Shop Stop. Today we want to pass on a tip that we actually learned from uh, one of our viewers, and that's on how to fix fence with, uh, with just a claw hammer and, uh, and regular fence pliers. So you, you splice in a section of fence and then you loop in the, the broken part of the fence. And so once we've got this, and you'll want to use, you're either going to have to pull the barbs off the wire so you can stretch, stretch it through here, or just uh, keep some of this barbless wire handy. Uh, but basically we're going to pull it up and get it, uh, get it kind of tight here, get about a 90 on it, hook it with the claw hammer and get it at about the right place so we can, uh, let's see if I can get this turned around here right. That, that looks similar to the last way. Yeah. And so then we're going to roll our hammer over and here 
Oh yeah, get it, keep it tight. You get the head of the hammer here, and we'll start pulling it through. And you basically see winding up on the head of that hammer and stretching it. So we'll stretch it kind of like this. And uh, we're not going to stretch it too tight because once you start stretching it up and, and rolling it on the on the head of the hammer, you can actually break the wire. And so you'll want to make sure that you kind of stretch it up. And, and some of this wire we're using here is old and I don't want it to whack me in the back when it breaks. So as you roll it up and you've, and you've, uh, you've got it up on and, and, uh, the head of your hammer and you've pulled it up tight, then it's just a matter of bending it over and getting your wire, uh, getting that bend in it so you can pull it back. And then you can take your hammer out and go ahead and finish the, uh, and finish the job. So you've pulled it up tight. But the big key is, is getting a, your hammer hooked in here, rolling it over, and basically you're just spooling it up on the head of the hammer. So that's a, a quick way to mend some fence without an actual stretcher. We'll see you next week on Shop Stop. If you've got those ideas, just so send them into the Sun Up Show and we'll try to pass them on. If you look at the southern United States, it's a, a carbon sequestration basket for, for the United States. And roughly Next week on SUNUP, we'll take a close look at OSU's involvement in the Pine Map program. In the meantime, we invite you to visit our website where you can see and share clips from today's show and get a special look inside the archives of the Museum of the Red River and take a look at the wood art exhibits at the Forest Heritage Center. Thanks for joining us, and be sure to check us out on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. I'm Austin Moore, and we'll see you next week at Sunup.